It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our next two speakers. Um, first and foremost, we have Dr. Gerald Midgley. Uh, Professor Midgley is at the uh, Professor of Systems Thinking in the Business School at the University of Hull. He uh, also holds adjunct professorships at the um, University of Queensland, Australia, other ones in Sweden and New Zealand. He's all over the place teaching all kinds of stuff to all kinds of people. Um, <clears throat> he was the director of the Center for System Studies at Hull from 1997 to 2003, and then again from 2010 to 2014. He has more than 300 papers published on systems thinking, action research, and stakeholder engagement, and he's been involved in a wide variety, and I do mean a wide variety, of public sector, community development, and resource management projects. He is also one of our, our uh, longest, long-standing collaborators and good friend, so we are happy to have you here, Gerald. And he is joined by um, Dr. Rachel Lilly. Rachel is the co-director of the Behavioral Insights Research Center at um, Aberystwyth University, which I practiced pronouncing three times because it looks so strange in writing. Um, she's, she's currently developing a master's program in systems thinking and leadership, while also working on a Sport England funded project in the East Riding of Yorkshire looking at a systemic approach to increasing activity. She's also a behavior change consultant and trainer, providing research input through a partnership with the Birmingham University Leadership Institute. And also I'm sure is going to become another one of our longstanding collaborators and friends. So welcome to you both, Gerald and Rachel. I will let you all get started. Thank you very much. Um, and let me thank you, uh, Laura and, and Derek, for inviting us here. Um, it's an honor to speak to your, your conference. And I just want to start with a personal story about why we're collaborating. Um, and that will lead into explaining why I'm also collaborating with Rachel. So um, the thing perhaps I'm best known for in the systems research community is curating this large variety of systems approaches that have been developed over the last hundred years. Um, and um, it's um, one of those kinds of um, situations where there are so many systems approaches that all have such very different um, perspectives on what systems thinking is, that it's actually hard for somebody to tell somebody who's coming to the field for the first time what systems thinking is and still pay respect to that kind of breadth of knowledge in the field. Um, and in that situation, I was just very, very lucky in 2008 to be sent one of Derek and Laura's first papers sent to a referee journal to review. And the basis of their argument was that um, we can actually set aside this diversity uh, and confusing cacophony of different approaches and really get back to basics. What are the simple rules that underlie systems thinking? And they talked about DSPR. So uh, D for distinctions, exploring boundary distinctions, S for system, exploring how parts combine into holes, uh, R for relationships, exploring how you map relationships, and P for perspectives, understanding the system from different perspectives. And as soon as I saw this paper, I just thought, wow, it was one of those eureka moments. I realized that the, um, the, that instead of actually setting aside all these different approaches, you can use this framework to actually uh, show how they all relate together. You can actually unify the field with it because all of the different approaches prioritize one of those systems thinking skills or one of those systems thinking concepts. So some, for example, are all about exploring boundaries. Some are all about exploring perspectives. Now, every single one of those approaches uses all four of the concepts, but they have this dominant one that enables you to see where, where its major strengths are and also then where its weaknesses are. Um, so, I, I actually um, wrote to Derek and Laura when I read that paper, visited them in 2014, and we hatched the idea uh, we then got a book contract for. And you see the book cover that is about to be released on your screen. So it's taken 2014 to 2023, and we're a couple of months away from uh, having that 
uh, book go into press. And it's all about that kind of framework, the DSPR framework, and all of the other systems approaches that can be actually um, organized around that framework. Um, so although we have a really ambitious agenda, I think, um, working with uh, Derek and Laura and myself, I was still aware that there was something missing. So what DSPR does and is very useful for is help uh, metacognition. So it helps us think about our own thinking. Um, and um, the, the, the way it does that is to help us think about our own thinking in relation to the outer world, the work we're doing. What seems to be a little missing from that though is understanding the self that is giving rise to that thinking. So um, I was actually aware of the need to really think about the history of experience that somebody brings to, uh, to a systemic intervention and really understand our biases and our, our partialities and how ourselves really create the interventions that, that we do because we're part of the systems we work in. We're not separate observers of them. And then I met Rachel Lilly a couple of years ago and I realized that she had the other missing part of the systems thinking framework that I was really trying to build. So I realized that joining up what Rachel offered with what Derek and Laura Cabrera are offering um, is gonna really advance things. So her ideas are grounded in neuroscience in the same way that uh, Derek and Laura Cabrera's work is also grounded in neuroscience. And I've actually been fortunate enough to have done that project with her uh, on with Sport England that um, Laura mentioned when she introduced Rachel and observed her practice coaching leaders and seeing how it transforms um, their practice. So the coaching is specifically focused on meta-awareness and meta-awareness um, is two things. It's basically um, the enhancing awareness of bodily feeling, what's going on in your body as you're engaging in the world. And it's also awareness of how those feelings get interpreted as, emo in, as emotions and how that partners with our cognition. So it's interception, which is about understanding our feelings, and it's also about metacognition. So Rachel in a minute is going to um, introduce the cognitive science and its implications for developing meta-awareness. Uh, click slide, please, Rachel. Um, she's going to give an example from the work with the Welsh government. Uh, click slide again. And then I'm gonna come back in at the end and tie together with what Rachel is saying um, with what I've already said just now about Derek and Laura's work and the work we're doing with them. So I'll hand over to you, Rachel. Lovely, thank you. And um, thank you very much for um, inviting me along to speak alongside Gerald on this. Um, yeah, very, I uh, feel very grateful and privileged to be on this platform. So yeah, thank you, uh, Laura, for that. Um, and, and well done for pronouncing Aberystwyth as well. <laughs> useful place it was welcome to come and visit so yes I met as Gerald said we um, met whilst we were working we've been brought in separately to work on a project that was very much looking at uh, uh, working with a systemic intervention and uh, my work to that point um, well, extended a long time back into the public sector as well and working with kind of complex problems but um, I'd ended up working a lot with leaders and building leadership capabilities and around systems thinking. And um, one of the conversations we've been having was the fact that so much of their work in involved making meaning in the world. How do they, you know, uh, with each other, um, uh, having conversations, relationships, the embodied mind all the time. That's what we're doing right now. And yet, what did they understand about this embodied mind, this thing that they're using all the time? You know, if they were if they were uh, fixing cars, they, you know, they'd understand a bit more about the mechanics. What do they actually understand about the mind? And um, they were very surprised themselves when they reflected on it to think, well, actually, we don't understand a huge amount about this thing. Uh, I think they talked about being taught to um, 
uh, deal with uh, recruitment and 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 uh, and disciplining, and that's the only kind of human psychology that they they really engage with as leaders. So we started to talk about, and and you can see that in the world today, there's there's lots of things. Thinking fast and slow is a very common one people will go to, and cognitive bias that are talking about how we understand our minds and trying to give people an insight into how minds work uh, in order to make decisions. So Kahneman's work, which obviously he developed with um, Tversky in the 70s, um, and out of that, there, a lot of, a lot's come out in terms of confirmation bias and a lot of workplaces look at these biases. But as part of my research and work in the air, this area, I started to look into where neuroscience and, and cognitive science was right now. And I found some critiques of Kahneman um, in terms of, well, that's actually a, not how the mind operates. We understand a lot more about how the mind operates now. And whilst this might be a useful metaphor, it's not telling us the whole picture. And that took me into considering, and, and what I do actually as part of my when I'm talking to people about minds and how minds work, is to take a moment to consider the history of brain science. Uh, I think this is really useful because actually this science is very, very young. And what we understand about the mind is very limited even now, um, but it has moved on in the last little while. So a lot of what we understand about our mind is very intuitive. You know, well, I'm using one, seems to work, I'm kind of getting by. Uh, it's a very intuitive thing, and we don't really get taught much about the mind. Now, I've got this here because actually for quite a few hundred years, people's intuitive sense was that the, was the mind was in the heart because that's where it felt thinking was. So people were very clear that this must be the thinking capacity of the body. Um, and then, well, it took a while before people kind of cut people open, you know, due to religion and beliefs, you know, it wasn't something that was done, then it was done on criminals. And, you know, what do you do when you cut this thing open, you find this organ, you find, you know, these bits, how do you work out how these are sense making machines? So, you know, they came up with hypotheses around animal spirits, different ventricles in the brain doing different things. Um, but some of these were quite fantastical. Um, and then we have people trying to work out, like Freud, how the mind works through talking therapies. Um, so obviously Freud's work is very prevalent. A, a lot of us will use the word ego or subconscious, but he was just guessing himself really and coming up with some interesting ideas that have definitely informed science, but don't ne aren't necessarily seen in terms of what, you know, we actually see the brain doing and we, we understand the brain to be doing right now. So it's worth thinking about other sciences. Um, you know, uh, if we if we take you know the universe and where the Earth sits for a long time, because intuitively we looked up and we saw that the sun was going around the Earth. That's what we thought was the case. We looked across. We thought the Earth was flat because um, that's what it looked like. It wasn't until the invention of a telescope, which actually saw things that we do not intuitively see, we cannot see that we learned some quite radical things about how the universe operates. So what am I saying here? Well, it wasn't until we got a brain scanner that we started to see beyond our intuitions. Um, we started to see a brain, a live brain, um, you know, working. And this actually was only in the mid nineties. So that's not a long time ago in terms of science that we actually were able to see the brain operating in this way. And when we did, we've started to see some, some um, a real parrot. There's been a real paradigm shift in how we see the mind operates in the same way that Galileo caused a real paradigm shift in terms of how the universe works and where the Earth is situated relative to the sun. So I would say, working with my leaders and um, most people, if I ask them how how their minds work, which I often do, they'll kind of say, oh, well, there's a world out there and I, I kind of see it. It comes in through these senses. And yeah, there's kind of filters. We know there's some filters, maybe in systems thinking, we talk about mental models that operate. Um, and we know we need to kind of do something about that. You know, this isn't an, an accurate description of your sense of what we see. And we respond to the world. And, you know, there's lots to say that this is how our world is designed. If I've worked a lot in policymaking, economics, and it's it's based on the idea there is this rational world and we can vaguely respond rationally to it. Um, 
Kahneman's work pointed to us being less rational. But the um, the kind of stuff they started to see in the in the scanner, really, um, which has really created a shift, is that the world isn't out there coming in. It's much more the activity is that we're going out attempting to make sense of the world. So this is much more rather than a bottom up perception model. It's a top down. The, the, the signals are coming much more out of the mind. So there's a world out there and we really are picking up scraps of that world. And we're sending out predictions or expectations based on prior experience that um, kind of fills in the gaps. We don't really see what's there. Um, and there's some wonderful stuff I could show you if we had time to show that that to be the case. We think we're seeing what's there, but we're not. We're kind of using our predictions to piece it all together in a way that actually constructs the world far more than we appreciate. And obviously we pick up errors. That's the way we learn. That's the way we shift and change. Uh, but those signals are weaker. And in a way I should make these arrows a little bit smaller than they are. I think they've They've grown over time, but those signals are weaker. Um, we're picking up those prediction errors through all our senses, through our felt sense, hearing, um, all sorts of senses are picking that up to update these numerous priors. So uh, sometimes one of the researchers that works on this or thinkers, Andy Clark, he talks about um, an example of this, uh, and, and I'm hoping this is gonna translate to the States where um, or other countries, um, where, where tea might not be drunk so often, but uh, you get a cup of tea. Somebody gives you a cup of tea, doesn't quite taste right, but this is a cup of tea. Takes you a little while, maybe half the cup, and you suddenly realize actually it's just a bad cup of coffee. You asked for a cup of tea, so you expected a cup of tea, so you tasted a cup of tea, and it takes a while for you to work out that that's not what it is. That would be the expectation effect. Um, you've lost your phone, um, you're looking everywhere, someone points out that it's just on the edge of the table. The expectation effect, the effect of the predictive mind is you literally, you literally didn't see it until somebody changed your expectation, your prediction. And obviously this works with people and it does speak to confirmation bias. Um, so somebody comes towards you, you use priors, you're creating this person before you've even spoken to them and you speak to them with some sense of who they are based on that prior, which in some sense creates, uh, invites them to respond in a different, in a particular way. And together you're, you're much more creating the world um, than the, uh, your, your intuitive model um, suggests. This would be another example of our predictive mind. If you go across, you're expecting a B, so you see a B. If you go down, you're expecting a number, so you see a number. So we're constantly using these predictions. Some of you may see have seen this illusion before. If you have, then you will see a particular shape in it. You won't not be able to see a shape because that prior will give you that shape. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, it'll just look like black and white blobs. If I give you some lines, it starts to look like something. And now you kind of have a prior, which will be there when I take the lines away. So we, we can work a lot with these illusions to really reflect on what this means. So, um, and part of this is um, within this new realm of research, our understanding of emotions has really shifted. So whilst most of us now um, have a sense there's emotional intelligence, emotions um, aren't things that need suppressing, the work on this has really moved towards cognition and emotion being completely interlinked. So thoughts and feelings coming together in ways that um, completely color each other, um, which isn't really what emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence does not go to that kind of level of understanding of emotions. Um, so as Wilkinson says here, so we have these things arising, we have kind of our inferences, our predictions are arising that are combining our felt sense with our predictions. Um, so that all plays a part in generating the world that we are actually creating. Okay, so we've rushed through quite a lot of contemporary neuroscience there. And um, usually I would take, you know, a, a good half a day to move us slowly through that, to take on to take that on board. Um, what we're really saying 
is, as I say, in, in systems thinking, we have mental models. There's these models of mind that people use. They, I say they often draw on Kahneman type work. But actually, although they do point to us not seeing reality, they don't really represent it in a way that actually neuroscience is saying it's, 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 it's worse, if you like, than we thought it was. Um, that we're doing, we're basically much more designed to create the world we expect to see. We call this a bias, but obviously then, if that's the way the world is, the, the mind's wired, then it's not a bias, it's, it's, how, we, it's how we operate. Um, so if, if it's on that end of the spectrum, um, and often when I do this workshop, I did one um, actually to Harvard the other, the other week and um, just a workshop online and someone stood up and said, well, you know, how on earth, what do I do? You know, how my anticipations um, are just creating my world, what on earth do I do? So I think that becomes uh, part of the question, really. And obviously, systems approaches, DSRP, all attempt to, to deal with this. But is there more that we can do? And I guess that's um, that's where I came to. Um, what can we add here that's going to actually do more to see through these anticipations, assumptions, predictions? And um, so what I use is uh, attention and interception practices. So interception, some of you ever practiced a body scan. It's that ability to feel the sensations arising in the body, along with the ability to see the arising of thoughts, um, which if we understand this according to a predictive mind model, um, allow us to start to see the kind of weighting we're giving to predictions one over the other. So we've kind of got a, a drill that's starting to really build our capacity to see that. Um, we can then actually spend time deconstructing our thinking, you know, what's that thought? Why that thought? You know, why that um, prediction anticipation? We then kind of have this third level, which DSRP offers, where we can then think about how we're applying our thinking and using this framework to that external world. So we kind of end up with three levels of metacognition. We end up with the awareness of arising thoughts, feelings, and you know, you can do this at all different levels. You can do it on quite a simple level. You can spend many hours, and I have done, you know, watching this kind of process arising which you can then spend time deconstructing some of those arisings um, with self-inquiry practices. You know, what is the meaning that I make in this situation, which speaks back to what Gerald was saying earlier. So then we've got a much better understanding of our own thinking, our own arising of thought, then adding that on to applying something like, or applying DSRP as a metacognitive practice to think about, and then, how am I thinking about this issue using this framework? We end up with these three levels, which um, really does more to address this predictive mind we're addressing. So uh, I guess the question is, is the one on its own enough? Could we add value by adding these other levels? So just to go back to my senior leaders in Welsh government, um, which is yeah, where I'm based, so this program, which was all about building additional capacities, um, particularly in the context of a sustainability act. So Wales um, is really leading the way in terms of sustainability and has this Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So I gave this program as part of that work. And I'll give you the example of our senior director, just to kind of ground this in something and what happened. So the senior director, he, you know, he's probably in his 50s or so. He'd been working in government for years. And again, he said, well, I've, I've never really done much reflecting on how my cognition, how my mind works. And now that I understand it quite differently and we've done these practices, um, he says he, he started to see things quite differently. So he said, well, before the programme, you know, he was a nice man. He said, I felt I respected people, but he had this rep, he was given this reputation, he said, as a Rottweiler. I was the person that went in and, you know, I listened to what people were saying. Of course I did. But um, I, uh, you know, I was a person that went in and just told these people what to do. And once he had a very different understanding of how things worked, he said, well, if that's true, I need to approach issues, other people, relationships quite differently. So he, see, he then quoted, you know, I now have a new understanding of how people work in the world, um, about how we create 
our own worlds and about how we can use that to challenge the rigidity that exists in terms of our work. So um, after the work, after the program, he said, well, now I'm putting myself in other in, um, in the other person's shoes. I'm trying to see the world through their eyes and understanding why they find these things difficult and why they or their organizations, because he's a senior civil servant, so he's working actually across the health service in Wales. Um, I'm, he described it as being more empathetic and not judgmental, he supposed. Um, so I'm gonna think about this in, in DSRP terms um, and suggest that what we've achieved now is a more systemic approach using this way, just this way of kind of working. And I didn't use DSLP at the time, obviously, but we're making, bringing that across and thinking what did we achieve that um, would also support DSLP. So now he's seeing different distinctions. He's seeing himself differently. He's seeing the other differently. He's recognizing others as fuller selves, widening his own boundary perspective to include other perspectives. Uh, so previously, the system he saw, you know, was one that existed from his perspective um, and uh, was quite limited with little appreciation of um, uh, new uh, other, other kind of emergent properties. So he's more able to see new system, new emergent properties. He described talking honestly for the first time about what's really going on. Uh, and I know with DSRP, we talk about, you know, how we see reality. So now there's a completely different uh, sense of what reality might be. Having a proper conversation about the problem um, and coming up with alternatives to take it forward. He's having a new conversation, enabling to identify different connections and causalities that fit with different relationships. And he's improved his own self-reflection because it makes complete sense. It's like, why wouldn't I? I have to do this because, you know, I cannot trust my mind. I'm seeing my mind as something very different to, to, to how I saw it before. And he reports, as you saw, seeing completely different perspectives and seeing other people's perspectives completely differently, questioning his own assumptions um, about the thoughts or perspectives of whoever he's talking to. So he's, he, by his own admission, he has completely changed the way he listens to others. Uh, and that was really represented by two years later, I met somebody who'd come to a talk uh, and said that the senior leaders change in the way he works completely. You know, she's seen the change across two or three levels. Uh, so that was really testimony to that shift. So I think I'm gonna pass back to Gerald now to bring some of that together. Yeah, so if you can flip slides, yeah. So it's time for me to end the talk by going back to DSPR and to the work that Derek Law and I are doing. Um, just to refresh your memory, there's a whole load of systems approaches for intervening in the world. So there's approaches for planning, for evaluating, for designing organizations, many other things. And DSPR um, D, uh, can help us organize these into a comprehensible framework. It can also give us that uh, simple story of what systems thinking is, so other people can get it quickly and easily. And it can help us with our metacognition, help us think critically about our own thought patterns. Still though, that critical thinking is mostly focused on our thoughts about the outer world, the world we're working in. Um, but those thoughts arise with emotions, and both our thoughts and emotions are rooted in our own personal histories of experience, which drive those anticipations that Rachel talked about. So how do we understand the impacts of that on our systems thinking? And the answer is through the meta-awareness that Rachel talked about. So better interoception gives us more data about our feelings. Better metacognition helps us see how our feelings are interpreted as emotions, which arise together with our thoughts and create those anticipations. And so the agenda that um, Rachel Lilly is bringing here and that the Cabreras are bringing actually can be fused together. So if, if you look at this slide, Rachel, if you could click one, um, the two together end up being more than the sum of their parts because greater self-awareness that Rachel is talking about here helps us see how our partialities, how our partial viewpoints and biases inform our anticipations and our interactions with the world. 
Um, so together with DSRP, it can really help us question our assumptions and build better uh, systemic interventions in the world. So the thing on the right represents a systemic intervention. We do a lot of our work in workshops. And it works the other way too, if you click the slide. Um, our better anticipations of the world we participate in, uh, which could be delivered through DSRP or other systems approaches, really provides context for our self-reflections and our self-awareness, because we're not isolated uh, from that context. Um, and it can even help us get a better political understanding of, of the context. So it can help us spot, for example, when we, we um, are making assumptions that come from ideologies that actually we would rather not have swallowed. And it can help us begin to think, rethink our assumptions in that way. So understanding the world helps us understand ourselves, helping us under, understanding ourselves, help us understand the world better, and it goes round and round in a circular process. So you can really see how the two things fuse together. Um, and all of this, including DSRP, um, it's fundamentally about improving our anticipations, um, which is why we say we can bring together uh, Derek and Laura's work um, on DSRP, Rachel's work here on uh, the predictive mind and mind to create what we think could be the next step in systems thinking. And we call it an anticipatory systems perspective, because fundamental, uh, fundamental to this is that notion of anticipation, that as we actually look around the world, as you're looking at the world um, through your eyes, what you're seeing um, is an anticipation of what um, is going to be useful to you next. So it really is fundamental to human experience. Thank you very much. Excellent. That was great. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, we'll do a little bit of uh, Q&A here, and we have lots of questions, but I'll start with... Um, so I, I agree about the importance of interception and attention and prediction and things like that, but um, one thing you mentioned was that thoughts about the DSRP kind of is geared towards thoughts about our outer world, but reality includes our inner world, right? So so DSRP has as much to do with an inner world as an as outer world. So um, it really is about the simple rules for organizing information. So why do you, why, I guess I'm wondering how you or why you make the distinction that the same DSRP rules can't be applied to internal information every bit as much as they can be applied to external information. You want to do it, Rachel, shall I? Well, yeah, I could. I mean, I'm kind of, if you don't mind, Derek, thank you for yeah. the question. Uh, nice to meet you. Yes, uh, nice to meet you. It'd be lovely almost to put the question back to you uh, in terms of, uh, I can kind of get a sense of what you're saying, but how does it do that then? How does it deal with that internal world? Can you just, um, is, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, so I mean, again, it's DSRP is not, doesn't really have any judgment about what's internal or external. Uh, it just is making distinctions. So for example, uh, you're making distinctions with your tongue. You're, you're distinguishing based on the cells on your tongue between different tastes, bitterness, sweetness, et cetera. You're making distinctions with your ear or with your eye. It's not all sort of like uh, cognitive brain kind of stuff, although obviously the brain's involved in that. Um, and, and likewise, you're making distinctions between sadness and melancholy, uh, you know, so that's your internal emotional state. Uh, and then that emotional state alters your perspective on what maybe somebody said to you or something like that. So you need to understand that that emotion, distinguishing that emotion leads to a mental model that you create meaning around something. And then perhaps you take offense at something that was not made to be offensive, right? And so you are you are exactly like you say, creating the world, uh, but you're creating it through organizing information in a particular way. 
So in a way, I'd love it if I could rewind and unpick what you just said piece by yeah. piece. Yeah. Because, um, you know, some of what you said, you, you know, uh, so you spoke about, um, you know, we've got a, a feeling. You talk about distinctions and then you talked about, um, so we've got these different sensations. We've got these ter- this kind of internal feeling uh, and mm-hmm. we're distinguishing between one or the other. So if you looked at... Um, Feldman Barrett's work you're you're still talking to me a little bit more like uh, the world's coming in and I'm responding to it because in a way even that distinction you're making uh, or one emotion over another is a prediction based on priors so if that's a prediction based on priors I have I'm ahead of myself I'm not making I'm like I've already done it before any of this kind of other stuff has happened and the the felt sense I have, uh, Feldman Barrett would talk about, well, there's a whole set of ingredients in that. So in a way, it, it speaks to your distinctions, because at some point, let's take fear and excitement, you know, let's take a roller coaster, you know, we know, you know, in that sense, we will, we will create, well, we'll get confused, because we will be frightened, and we will also be scared, and the ingredients are all there. In other instances, we get in the same set of ingredients, we call that you know, there's a snake, you know, we're running away from a snake. We've constantly got these predictions coming. But if you, uh, to see the arising of these predictions, which are ahead of us, I'd say we still need to go one layer back from where you are in terms of watching, getting better at noticing this arising, which is really complex and slightly ahead of us. So yes, DSRP can help us with this and we can use DSRP to kind of almost help us deconstruct some of that arising, but there's a layer almost behind it uh, that I say would add value and certainly adds value in the work that I do. Yeah, no, I definitely think interoception and attention is is super valuable. I mean, it, it's fundamental to to uh, everything we do in metacognition. Uh, I, guess, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding how how do we notice something without having some perspective or some or making some distinction because if we're noticing something then we're not noticing something else something something is arising out of out of the not thing and therefore not only are we distinguishing something but we're creating a part whole system we're creating a relationship and we're and we're taking a perspective and being able to see that is the very definition of interoception attention cognition emotion all those kinds of things so without splitting hairs or boring the audience now <laughs> uh, yeah, there's almost like i mean it's, there was that point isn't it and, and and you know i've actually i have done a lot of meditation i have done a lot of meditation although i do separate this from meditation because you know, it's in that sense of a ground of experience, a space where you see multiple things arising, yeah. actually, yeah. which you are, you are making some distinctions, but it's almost like this is where, and in fact, this whole brain, uh, predictive brain has real impact on the whole meditation world and what they're saying happens in meditation because it moves it from, um, they would normally talk about stimulus response and you are kind of putting a pause in order to see better, if you like, your distinctions. But this actually shifts it towards what you're seeing. You're seeing more of those, of what's arising. You are actually stepping back from jumping into distinctions to see more of the potential distinctions that might be being made in order to actually have more available in terms of what you might see that's actually going on. I think it's that, and there are experiences, I think, where you can get to where there does seem to be more of a ground. You're seeing more of what's arising, but yeah, it's almost, I can see it's like a bit of a spectrum, a bit of a kind of block where we're kind of working at different levels or something. Mm -hmm. Right, and and part whole part whole would take you up and down those levels. But let's yeah. uh, let's. Oh, sorry, Gerald. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I add something? Because yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there's um, when I I mean I was the one I think who actually made that comment about it's more outward looking in the world, I, and I'm certainly saying you see your faults. Uh, you're doing the metacognition in relation to that outer world. So I'm not saying it doesn't apply to the um to the internal world um but it 
the whole notion of metacognition is about operating with a conscious notion of, for example, distinction or a conscious notion of perception or whatever. And uh, so what Rachel's talking about is uh, widening that awareness prior to that. So, so it's absolutely, I think it would be useful for the middle layer that um, that uh, Rachel was talking about. When you start to actually uh, deconstruct uh, what, uh, you know, what this actually means to you, I reckon DSC, DSRP can actually be applied back to that. But whether it's actually useful, um, uh, well, certainly your body is making distinctions as it's as it as your feelings arise, but the conscious mind isn't necessarily doing that until you actually exercise that. Right, uh, that's right, because you're you're doing DSRP whether you like it or not. Being aware of it is just one part. Um, but I want to I don't want to take up all the time yeah. on my question. So let's um, let's go to the, some of the audience questions. Uh, since Rachel brought up uh, meditation, there's actually two questions about um, vipassana, uh, and maybe just share if if that has anything to do with your work or or is related uh, to your work, Rachel, vipassana meditation. Yeah, so I I know vipassana and I practice vipassana, which is um, if you do the full, it's like ten days, just watching your in silence, watching your thoughts and your felt sense. So I I am very interested and and I'm kind of quite known in that world um, for for this model of mind to actually shift what's happening in those kind of processes um, and the frame that's being used because as as we know whatever frame you're given for your experience impacts your experience so if we shift the might if we shift the frame from a, a stimulus response mind which is generally what's used in 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 meditation all forms of meditation to a prediction mind it, it fundamentally shifts the practice so it's a wider conversation but it is linked and vipassana is an amazing practice for really noticing this arising of thoughts um definitely uh okay great uh gerald i think this one's for you what's the difference between your anticipatory uh and robert rosen's anticipatory systems yeah sure so um, in the long version of this presentation, we, we ended up having to cut out a whole lot of stuff to uh, to fit this into uh, 30 minutes. And there was a whole section on how um, Robert Rosen actually really first was the first person to realize the importance of uh, anticipation, both in defining life um, and also building that understanding of how we, we carry a model of uh, inside ourselves. Um, that we're working from. So uh, it's fundamental to, to what um, we're doing. And we would recognize him as one of the key originators in the 80s. Likewise, uh, Maturana with his theory of autopoiesis, and, and, and he was talking about the complete entanglement of emotion and cognition um, in the already in the 1970s as well as the 1980s. So there are a lot of early writers on this. Um, at the same time, the neuroscience has taken us a lot further and has provided a lot of evidence, actually, that um, that can advance our understanding. So, yeah, both uh, both um, the older stuff and the new stuff, I think, can be very useful. Excellent. Uh, this one is, Dr. Lilly, can you speak to the qualitative methodology used and how you related it to DSRP framework or lens, uh, ref the studies highlighted? Um, so I used mainly qualitative methods. I used, um, so, well, I actually used David Snowden's SenseMaker um, uh, kind of uh, method to collect quite a lot of narratives from the uh, leaders in the first instance. I don't know if some of you are aware of David Snowden. He's quite... Um, uh, significant in the systems world and then I used um, semi-structured interview mainly semi-structured interviews and observation participant observation or a bit of an ethnography but oh that was repeated with two or three other um, researchers being involved over a two or three year period um, in terms of DSRP I wasn't working with DSRP at that time but we're looking at it with Gerald we thought it was useful to kind of think about because I uh, I know, as you're saying, 
Derek, to kind of that if we are taking a more systemic approach, then uh, people will, um, you will see, DSRP will become better, your ability to see more distinctions, more of the system, et cetera, et cetera. So I was demonstrating really that what, what these people had allowed them to, it kind of proved a little bit what you're saying really, um, without DSRP, they still appeared to be applying DSRP. Yes, yes, that's a good point. Um, and I think that, let me see here, God, we're gonna... I guess that's why it was kind of making the case that the two might be, um, you know, helpful to each other because if one, if no, I, think, really I agree with that. Out. I agree with that. I think I think if you imply apply the you know if you utilize your awareness of DSRP while doing interoception, or while doing metacognition, or while doing all those things, um, then then you're going to get better results. I I, I think. Um, it would it's hard for to me to imagine a world where you could do any of those things without taking a a bodily or cognitive perspective so i just want to be clear that dsrp is not a cognitive theory dsrp is a physico cognitive theory so it's an embodied theory and you could you could essentially remove your brain and still be doing dsrp um and we've shown that with you know amoebas are doing dsrp and atoms, you'll learn later, actually atoms studied by physicists are doing DSRP. So um, it's not, uh, yeah, I, I guess that, yeah. that what I would say, but I agree with you wholeheartedly that interoception and uh, attention, paying attention to your attention and how that attention is affecting your bias and all those kinds of things are critically important and a huge part of what we're learning from neuroscience. Um, so. so so can I just say, Derek, from, from my perspective as a, as a practitioner, um, I think it's an important distinction that you're making between um, a body's ability, uh, simply uh, making distinctions, um, taking perspectives, and when we do that consciously. Um, yes. I, I'm particularly interested in um, how it can actually be built into um, uh, leadership development, for example, yeah. how, it, how it can augment the different systems approaches, and it uh, and we I think it's really important not to conflate those two things. Oh, wholeheartedly, I agree with that a hundred percent. I mean, you're doing DSRP whether you like it or not, but the real benefit is going to come by when you become more aware of it, because then you can see what you're doing and why you're doing it, and a lot of that's based on your life experience and all these past things and. And it is bringing the world forward ra rather than seeing the world, right? You're you're bringing the world into existence. And that, while that can be, you know, lead to all kinds of creative things, it can also lead to disastrous effects as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so uh, unfortunately, we got to wrap there uh, with the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Midgley and Dr. Lily for being here. Uh, and um, we're... Laura is going to take over. Okay, thank you.